present your session for the day. Uh, this is session four, which is performing the pandemic from the audiovisual to the pedagogy. And I welcome uh, the chair, Indrani Das Gupta and rapporteur Paki to please take over this session and introduce the speakers. Thank you. Okay, so uh, thank you so much. Uh, a very good evening to everyone present here and thank you so much for joining us. Uh, as Ananda has already told us, this is the fourth session of the Young Researchers Conference and the title of this, confer uh, of this conference is Performing the Pandemic from the Audiovisual to the Pedagogic. Our chair today is Indrani Das Gupta. She is a researcher from Jamia Millia Islamia and uh, she is in the Department of English. So I'll now pass on the digital mic to Indrani. Thank you, Paki. Thank you to the organizing team for having me, you know, to chair this session. And a very good evening to all, you know, all those who have joined us and particularly to the presenters. So this session, which is the fourth session of the first day of the Young Researchers Conference is titled Performing Pedagogic from the Audiovisual to the uh, Performing Pandemic from the Audiovisual to the Pedagogic. And we have four presenters for this session and 20 minutes have been allotted to each presenter and five minutes for question and answer round. I would request all our presenters to kindly adhere to the time limit. I would be giving you a buzz at 15th minute. So by the time, try to, you know, balance your presentation. So the first presenter for this session is Vasundra Gautam. She is PhD scholar from the Department of English, Jamia Millia Islamia. Her paper is titled, Lived Through COVID-19 Pandemic, Understanding Lived Experiences Through Haryanvi Folk Songs. So welcome Vasundra and over to you. Hi Indrani, am I audible or do I need- Yeah, Vasundra, you're audible. Yeah, yeah, I'm audible. audible. All right, great. So uh, before I start my paper, I don't have a presentation. I'll be reading my paper. Before it starts, uh, two things. One, that I called contemporary songs, folk songs. So I'm adhering to the definition that was given by Alan Dundies, where he says that two or more people who share some kind of experiences or ideas or joke, they are known as folk. And second is uh, that how uh, the folk songs mostly are um, embedded in this idea of lived experiences and for uh, experience within the Indian context or within Indian philosophy, we have quite a few words that Sundar Sarukai uh, explain in his work. So for example, for experience, we in Hindi, we have Anubhav or in, um, you know, Tamil, there is uh, Pattarebu and many others. So uh, with that, I will start my paper. Uh, lived experience is not about freedom of experience, but about the lack of freedom in an experience while describing the constituents and relationship between experience and experiencer. Sundar Sarukai asserts that lived experiences do not provide a scope for the experiencer to escape the experience, context, or content. Experience can be duplicated, but lived experience cannot be created or recreated at one's will. And willingly removing oneself from the situation due to the undesirable outcome is not feasible. It creates an unbreakable bond, which in turn creates absence of choice in an experience. Living through COVID-19 pandemic was or is one such absence of choice experienced by the world almost with the same intensity. I refer to the experience of loss of loved one when I remark that intensity is same. Various communities such as those disabled or daily wage earners have undoubtedly been impacted differently. We have also heard quite a few papers around caste and others where we understand that how different communities are affected differently during COVID. Uh, in December 2019, a cluster of pneumonia cases with an unknown cause was discovered in Wuhan, China. And in January 2020, that the world was informed about it. A surge in coronavirus cases is seen across the globe and within a short span of two months, the outbreak brought the world to a standstill. 
since we did not have much information about the severe acute respiratory sim syndrome, coronavirus 2, popularly known as corona or COVID-19, every country applied different strategies to deal with the unprecedented situation at hand. There are many, there are some strategies discussed by these women in the folk songs that I will be dealing with. The fear of the unknown not only caused what psychologists call death anxiety, but also caused panic among every class about food security to their livelihood. Midst of the world crisis, India has faced, faced its own set of challenges. On March 24, 2020, the Indian Prime Minister imposed a nationwide lockdown as the death toll rose around the world. In the last two years, India has experienced everything from the collapse of public and private healthcare system, migrant crisis, abandonment of dead bodies to lengthy lines in front of cemeteries and crematoriums. This paper looks into Haryanvi folk songs sung by women on YouTube about COVID-19 pandemic. We saw a boom in digital platform industry at the onset of COVID-19. Digital platforms like Zoom, Google Meet, Microsoft, Microsoft Team especially gained prominence during the COVID-19 pandemic. But YouTube was quite popular among people even before it. It is one of the largest platforms to display content. Its content ranges from educational videos, songs, movies, to cooking recipes and many more. Unlike Zoom or Google Meet, YouTube has less scope of active engagement and because of which many women singers prefer YouTube. Irrespective of it or because of it, people spent majority of their time on YouTube during the lockdown. Restrictions on the mobility during the lockdown, just a second, uh, allowed me to explore YouTube and other digital platforms. And that's when to my surprise, I learned about people's active engagement with the present day situation in creative ways. They were actively engaged in creating memes, reels, shorts to awareness videos. In fact, there were quite a few papers talking about how with increasing uh, days, we have more and more awareness videos on YouTube. For this paper, I would engage with folk songs uploaded on YouTube during the lockdown or pandemic. Haryana has folk songs for every occasion. My exploration of digital platforms not only led me to folk songs on COVID-19, but also about Geophone, Narendra Modi, Yogi Adityanath, and many other contemporary subjects. These folk songs are not available in printed text. Printed text mainly consists of ceremonial songs or miscellaneous songs. Miscellaneous songs were further divided into subcategories that include political love songs and many other songs on various topics. The kind of groupings that miscellaneous categories encompass, it might just include the contemporary folk songs as well. In Haryanvi culture, folk songs hold a special place. One could find a large body of literature sung by men and women, accord, uh, uh, and, men and women singers. According to Sadhu Ram Sarda, folk songs are most important folk form in folk literature to express folk mind in comprehensive manner. These folk songs consist of lived realities of Haryanvi society. Almost all folk songs emerge from the lived experiences of the people, be it the Jacha song, where the desire of the male child is blatantly obvious and the birth of a female child is moaned, or Dincharya songs, where women spend most of their time working throughout the day. In a similar vein, COVID-19 folk songs not only constitute the lived experiences of people surviving through the pandemic, but an amalgamation of traditional knowledge and state directives. So this is the first song. I won't be singing the song, nor I have a video of it, but uh, there are two very prominent lines in the song. One, uh, and they are repeated again and again throughout the song. So one is, Dekh Mere Bhagwan, Kitna bebas hai insan. This is one. And another is, Dekh mere bhagwan kuch nahi kar pa ra insan. Um, so a brief of, about what the folk song is about. The folk song calls upon God and informs him that humans are helpless and unable to deal with the cur current predicament. They discuss how COVID or Corona, which originated in China and then spread worldwide, 
doctors and Ayurvedic practitioners alike have failed. As the death toll is rising, even money couldn't free them from the problems. The female singers, Sukal and Nirmala, these are two women who, sing, who have sung these songs, request people to stay at home and ask them to pray to God for a quick end to this unusual catastrophe. The song, if observed closely, resembles with poet Pradeep's song, Dekh Tere Sansar Ki Halat Kya Ho Gai Bhagwan Kitna Badal Gaya Insan, from the 1954 film Nastik. The structure of many bhakti or religious songs is similar to that of the present folk song. It is difficult to pinpoint who affected whom. So these old poets and lyric writers, they have a huge impact of the folk culture on them. So which way it goes, it's something very difficult to point out. Most folk songs are complained to God about the condition of the world or mankind and how materialistic he has turned into. Unlike most songs, the aforementioned folk song emphasize on the powerlessness and helplessness of mankind. Once a person passes away, everything that was left behind, including money or a house, is lost. Both the allopathy and Ayurvedic doctors failed to understand the nature of a virus and falling ill themselves. All the knowledge that they gained from the years of practicing failed them. When Sukal and Nirmala sing, if we live, we will meet again, they serve as a reminder of a transient essence of existence and how insignificant humans are in the face of calamity. Doctors and common people in the, fall in the same category as far as the transience of life is concerned. They also request people to refrain from going out in the public spaces. Very similar request is made in the second song as well. So again, I won't read the song. But the crux of the song is, uh, the folk song encourages people to remain in their villages and form small groups uh, look, to look after the communities. They say we are fighters by nature. So uh, there is this one line in uh, the folk song, Bharat Varsh Janam Se Yuddha. So they refer to you know, the fighting spirit or the martial past of India. So therefore, we shouldn't be afraid or concerned about anything. Women vocalists make reference to Subhash Chandra Bose, who founded the Azad Hind Forge to battle the foe. In a similar manner, we should also create an army to fight against Corona and take care of people. The police are patrolling in the cities, but there's no one to do the same in the villages. So we should take the responsibility of patrolling. We shouldn't wait for the government to act now that we are aware how bad the situation is. Taking the Sarpanch in confidence, we should take some action. Watching TV won't solve the issue. Instead, we should develop our own tools to combat COVID. Both, have done, both of them, both the women singers, ask the people to pay attention. Uh, ask the people to pay attention as they repeat the state regulations of either washing hands or not going outside until and unless it's absolutely necessary. And in the case of people don't listen, then we should call the Haryana police. They are also, uh, um, they, are, they are asking people to take turns and create small tents near the borders of the village to discourage people to go out or inside the village. In the last couple of lines, they request people to listen to them carefully and request them to not make fun of them. Women singers in folk songs invoke historical figure of Subhash Chandra Bose to assemble people to create their own army to combat coronavirus. So from invoking God, they have now moved on to invoking the martial past of India. They appeal, uh, the appeal made in the first song was clearly not enough for the people to take care of themselves and follow the state directives. One could see a clear distinction in the two songs where one, they very carefully request, in, in the first song, they are requesting the people to follow the rule. In the second, they invoke the idea of army or a brute force or combat with people who do not follow the state directives. They also uh, go to the extent of calling Haryana police if people decide to go against the community action. Both women singer request to involve the local authorities to take the initiative of spreading awareness 
among people instead of waiting for the directives by the government. Both the women singers are very forthcoming and suggesting ways to fight COVID-19 to save people. Care and combat are both depicted in the folk songs of Haryana. There is a category of songs devoted to the First World War and the contribution of Haryana in it. Women were forthcoming in sending their sons or husbands to war. The emotion of pride and pain are invoked by women in those folk songs. Unlike the war songs, women in the second folk song request people to refrain from making fun of them. They immediately change from a confrontational tone to the repentant one. Women giving directives in a patriarchal society as Haryana is a little unheard of, especially on a public forum. So this is something I've mentioned earlier also, because there is less active engagement on YouTube. A lot of women prefer uploading their videos on YouTube. The, uh, the repentant or apologetic mode might also be attributed to the idea of good woman, where women of good household are not supposed to appear in public an idea to which women are subjected till date. More often than not, women's songs or songs sung by women do not have their signatures imprinted in the song. They sing, uh, they sing, but both the female singer name themselves in the process of singing the song. This was more common in Raganese and Sang where men sing and perform in the public spaces. The name of the women singers were mentioned in the song, but the poet or the author is unknown as they are neither identified or in the song nor on the YouTube channel. That part of the folk song remains in place where the authorial position is attributed to a community instead of an individual. So now there is this third song. And uh, yeah, so a brief uh, about this song. So women are hurling abuses to Corona, like Beiman or Bhima. You have five minutes left. Yeah, yeah, I'll wrap up in five minutes. I'll wrap up in five okay. minutes, maximum six. So women are hurling abuses to Corona, like Beiman and Badmash, constantly throughout the song. They scold Corona for scaring the world and due to which many people died. Women singers, uh, in a very defensive tone, address the fact that they take sattvic food, or to put it more simply, they don't eat non-vegetarian food, so why they should be targeted by COVID. So there is this reference to uh, China and eating bats. They pray to cow and live a very simple life. They switch their tone to a little attacking and tell Corona, uh, personified Corona, that we have great doctors and they will kill it. And lastly, they praise Haryana and their clean living habits. There is a tradition of Gali song or Gari songs in Haryana. Sitni to political songs, one could find women dissing. Smita Tiwari Jasal to many other scholars see it as a vent to their oppressed existence. For that matter, according to Eva Hejin, a clinical psychotherapist from the American Center of Psychiatry, Psychiatry says, when suppressed concerns and feelings such as lack of self-esteem, self-defeating thoughts and behavior, guilt and anger, for example, are not treated or dealt with, the person uses insult to unleash anger, to escape, dealing with the pain or trauma experienced to exert control and feel powerful. Since COVID brought the whole world to a standstill, these women who did not have any agency in their regular lives felt even more helpless. Their inability to control the situation and loss that almost everyone faced made them take recourse to abuses. Another idea that found center stage in these songs is of traditional knowledge, knowledge about life, food, and general conduct. Information that found space with the new age nutritionist. Nutritionists are reviving the idea of local and challenging different trends in the market. Women singers also refer to the same knowledge system of living healthy as their protective shield. It is due to the failure of the public private healthcare system that people were turning to these traditional knowledge systems. So to conclude, basically this paper through the folk songs has looked into the fear and apprehensions that developed as a result of healthcare systems collapse from the abuses hurled at COVID-19 to invoking God was a tool in the hands of women to navigate in an unknown terrain 
or to deal with their fears. The inability of removing themselves from the situation added to their plight more. Thank you. Thanks, I so guess I finished in time. Absolutely fascinating paper. I just loved it. I have to say, you know, you have included, you know, a range of emotions have been brought into bear on those, you know, Haryanvi songs where the, you know, the folk singers, not only did they speak about the transience of human life and the fragility of human existence, but they also, you know, intersected the divine with the material, with the social, with also sounding out a cautionary note to all the people not to venture outside. And of course, you know, invoking the historic past while also at the same time, you know, oftentimes using, abusing, you know, the corona as a personified figure. So remarkably they are you know weaving different kinds of stories out here just to you know ensure that people remain safe and so on i have a question before i pass on the question to other people i'm sure there will be many questions out here my question to you is you know when you're saying that you know on the youtube the you know the female singers are much more you know in a happier space because they do not have to actively engage with the audience. So before the YouTube, were they, you know, how were they engaging with the audience? You know, I'm not talking simply of Corona here, outside here. I mean, basically, you know, when they're talking about anything, something immediate and personal, how were they, you know, engaging with the audience? Were they still trying to remote, you know, remain alienated from the audience and just remain cocooned in their own sphere and then, you know, trying to invoke the social and the material life. How was it before the pandemic? Because the pandemic definitely has brought the mediatized, you know, atmosphere to our day-to-day -day lives. You know, we are, you know, engaging with each other through the Zoom platform. So, the you know, the digital space has become a part of our everyday lives right now. But before the pandemic, how did it all, you know, take place? You know, the kind of idiom and the registers that, you know, social registers, that you know happened between those singers and the you know the audience at large i'd like you to throw a little bit of light on it yeah sure so okay basically so these women folk songs were generally sung in private spaces instead of public so they were never uh, you know, so it's not that they were never audience, but they were never male audience to them. Okay. So they will always be surrounded by women. So private spaces in the sense they either veiled women, you know, so mm. one doesn't know who, who is singing what. So while, for example, uh, going to the fields to getting water, these women are veiled mostly and nobody would know who is singing what. Second, if another, uh, uh, this is what Prem Chaudhary actually calls private space. The other is, you know, the home. Again, for example, let's say uh, if they have to sing something and uh, there is a barat that goes. So women are left behind generally in Haryana. Uh, men don't prefer taking women in a marriage. So they all, uh, you know, are left behind. So they form their own group. They sing all kinds of song whether it does include a lot of pervasive songs, or sexually active to whatnot. I mean, they're, they're all con kind of content that they, you know, discuss or they sing about. And in fact, for that matter, perform. So I was very surprised when I saw uh, these songs on YouTube. These are generally two women or four or five women sitting. I could not find them singing or dancing, which generally is the case. Absolutely. I hope I answered yes. your question. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you, Asanda. That was you know, a bit of a knowledge information that I really wanted. So I open the floor for questions. And I think so I can see a question out here. Paki, would you like to take up yes, here? Yes, I would. Uh, thank you so much, first of all, Vasundra, for that extremely engrossing session. Uh, it was wonderful. I have a question from Muneep. He says, excellent paper, Vasundra. Do you think folklore has worked as a political tool of subversion or resistance across time? Would you be aware of a parallel urban load on Corona in contemporary India? Or oh, this is from Professor Anuradha Ghosh. Muneep has posted it. So... What is your response? Can you please repeat the question? Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah. Do you think folklore has worked as a political tool of subversion or resistance across time? Would you be aware of a parallel urban lore on Corona in contemporary India? Okay, parallel urban lore, I'm not very sure of, but to answer the first question, yes, it has. All. So, um, 
yeah it is used as a tool to subvert authority because when i talked about these private spaces where women perform or dance all kinds of songs and at times they are highly sexual in nature or pervasive in nature so in absence of a male gaze because um, generally male population is not around women uh, do all kinds of acts to subvert authority so i guess they feel that it's a um, you know secure and safe space where you know they do all kinds of things for that matter they challenge authority but as far as the political how i'm very sure that, that is the case but uh, contemporary urban folklore i have not come across till now that's something okay yeah so uh, i also okay there's another question by fezan he says interesting area of inquiry vasundra do you see any regressive elements in these strategies or directives advocated by these folk singers on youtube also what is their take on covid vaccine when a seg significant section of society is against vaccine do they challenge this apprehension of vaccine as well uh, as far as the song goes i could not find any reference to the vaccine because they were adhering to the traditional knowledge systems more than you know taking recourse to vaccine um uh, so yeah but uh, the uh, you know um, as far as whatever i have read on covid i do know that a lot of uh, you know especially in the villages people uh, you know did not want to get vaccines um, you know uh, and in so fact I, for that matter they think they have this idea that if they get vaccine they will die because the moment they reach hospital and these are many cases that came around that time so the moment they go to the hospital the person dies so they became more apprehensive about the fact that you know the vaccine will kill them or you know going to the hospital will can kill them so that is why the last song you know they ask everyone to stay in the village instead of going to the doctors or hospitals you know and they think that everything has failed Yeah. So I lead on from this question uh, and ask you about your opinion uh, on uh, or the audience's opinion rather on these traditional, uh, 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 you know, these traditional remedies or the gharelu nuskhas that folk songs present, uh, especially vis-a-vis -vis the debate of alternate medicines versus listening to the doctors in the pandemic. So you know, what is the response? There is this. Is there a fear that folk songs could perhaps uh, perhaps misguide a certain segment of the population, or or is there a, a resistance to the songs in that matter? sorry uh so uh there was resistance to allopathic medicines people did take so because uh, the doctors were dying and you know the people were not getting beds to people were not getting oxygen cylinder to what not uh if you if you have followed news there was the there was this whole resistance against this you know allopathic medicines in fact people were taking recourse to this alternate medicine be it unani ayurveda or homeopathy or for that matter i mean um, um, i don't know i don't want to call it stupid but you know they kind of started doing a lot of other things in, just in the name of alternative medicines so but there was very i mean they were very apprehensive of this fact that you know they 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 do they, they do not want to take recourse to allopathic okay thank you vasundra so we are running out of time uh, so uh, i'll please request you to post your answer in the chat box fezana has uh, uh, followed up with another question he says anything traditional may not be progressive could you please comment vasundra on the regressive elements in the songs if there is any so if you could please uh, uh, answer in the so chat we'll box i'll try to answer that in the chat box because okay, we are fine. running sure, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. thank you so much for this lucid presentation i am sure everyone will agree with me here that it was a wonderful presentation loved your take on it so moving on our next presenter for this session is krishna priya phd scholar from the department of humanities and social sciences national institute of technology telangana Her paper is titled "Unmasking the Features of the Pandemic Through Malayalam Cinema: A Study on Sanu John Varghese Arakam and Dilish Potham's Joji." So, over to you, Krishna. 
Am I uh, visible and audible? Yeah, you are. You are absolutely. Okay. So let me share my screen. Uh, okay. Can you see my PPT? Hello. Not yet. Not you yet. Can't, you can't. Okay. Just give me a second. I tried sharing my screen. Is it or is it we visible now? Yeah, yes. we can see it now. It is. Okay. So my paper is titled uh, "Unmasking the Features of the Pandemic Through Malayalam Cinema: A Study of Sanu John Varghese's." arkaryam and dilish potens joji uh, now coming into the malayalam cinema in general uh, the the kind of content the industry has been creating is uh, always rooted to the to the time and space so pandemic was a huge challenge in terms of bringing what bringing out what they can show right now and it was one of the first film industry to produce or to release a film or any uh, uh, or to respond to respond to the crisis so these uh, movies uh, joji and arkaryam both the movies were released in 2021 so arkaryam is a 2021 malayalam mystery drama directed and co-written by sanu john varghese uh it's an excellent film about the ethos and pangs of a film of three adults so uh, and their life is burdened by pandemic and this movie has simultaneously shown hope that comes occasionally to the surface of the narration and also the loop of trauma instilled by the pandemic so uh and uh, coming to dilish potens joji it is an adaptation of shakespeare adaptation by that i mean a loose adaptation of shakespeare uh and uh, this film has also surprised uh, the audience because taking shakespeare's macbeth and planting it somewhere in kerala in a very uh, you know in a place called mundakayam which is in kerala uh, which is in kottayam kerala and making it sound authentic it sound was a more challenge so uh, in these two aspect i will be uh, uh, i'll be looking at the two different narratives uh, that these two films try to bring during such a crisis now um, uh, the changing dynamics of home during pandemic the pandemic has been crucial for people who stayed under the same roof especially with disagreement so in joji we can see a home a patriarchal home where there is a tyrannical father who has three sons and there is a daughter in law who is actually uh, completely dedicating her whole life as a servant or maid inside the home and her whole life is uh surrendered inside this kitchen where she has no voice no opinion and she's uh even trying hard to vent out her emotions to her own husband then all the main characters in joji if you look at uh, all these three characters they are far apart they are islands they they are all either the, the main character joji played by fahad fasil he is in he is always in a room and this uh, her, his daughter and his uh, sister in law binsi she is in a she is always in a kitchen and there is his grandson poppy who is always in online class so somewhere this uh, there is a metaphor of pandemic being played inside the home because there is no actual nobody is affected by corona nobody is actually uh, disease or sick but they seem to be uh, you know distant they they are in uh, they are in islands they are in their own uh, spaces and on the contrary in arkaryam they try to show a home which is full of warmth and affection where the father ittiyavara who is a re retired school teacher cares for her daughter uh, an extremely loving dad and an extremely loving second husband so uh, that is uh, his uh, ittiyavara's daughter shirley she's married to roy 
so uh, they, they both of them were divorced and they got married so this home established a space where there are no uh, restrictions for all these three members to mingle and connect so these two homes are two different narrations of home there are like each home is different on its own uh, you know ways its own happiness its own frustrations but these two homes uh, during pandemic had two different narratives to speak especially in terms of uh, staging of the film now uh, these are the four images that that i collected from these two films now looking at the first image uh, towards the right uh, that is uh, that is where uh, i don't know whether it's very clear to all of you there is that binsi uh, in joji uh, in a kitchen and joji is sitting in the next room so throughout the film you can see these two people co uh, conversing but they are always in these two rooms and the 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 picture just below it is again a husband and wife binsi and her husband uh, jason they are also wide apart they are not together and the room itself is like very minimal uh, equipments we don't feel the warmth but when you look at the other side there is arcarium where these three people they are also burdened by a uh, uh, pandemic but they they are they are together there is a sense of togetherness and the husband and wife in arcarium uh, is what we see in the other picture where they are looking at each other and sharing warmth so uh, these pictures uh, is talks a lot about the staging and location during uh, during the time of covid so when we make especially uh, film making is all about people management space and time there are a lot of people involved and a lot of setting and location uh, sorry a lot of people is involved and a lot of time is consumed and uh, in kerala the rules were very strict and we had a huge uh, you know law and order thing going on uh, as part of the covid 19 restrictions so the location and staging while making of these films i found it very interesting and also responsible because uh, when something of this unprecedented level happens you know we get uh, a lot of apprehensions a lot of tensions and anxieties as to how we carry out the creative process now here we could see that they try they made use of the time and space and they created something out of it now the space utilization in joji and arcarium is incredible as it simultaneously followed the government rules of not risking the community health and also not compromising on the quality of the content now uh, about the location the central part of kerala is rich with big isolated homes around the rubber plantations especially in kottayam uh, and such choice of location actually benefited in pulling the story very clearly so you have a very wide space for each characters to uh, you know stay and uh, stay stay in distance and but still there is no what we understand as alienation and joji uh, joji's uh, joji's remarkable in staging because the characters are wide apart it conveys a lack of connection between the family members the art direction specifically look into a minimal approach of reducing the number of properties within a space that's what i have shown you in the picture then the reality of alienation or rather isolation has been a pertinent feature of the pandemic the attempt of uh, attempt of human beings to utilize their own limited property to find their joy and bury their frustration are all indispensable in chronicling the era of the pandemic the two selected films for the study say, stay close to the pandemic life as uh, life stand isolated exactly like the two homes shown in these movies i would like to uh, add a few more points to it uh, the changing when we talk about the changing dynamics of home in during pandemic especially in a dysfunctional setup uh, people are very distended uh, in joji there is no absolute no connection between 
uh, uh, the family members. Uh, there is a father who tried to kill his son and then it ended up in a maddening revenge. The father, the son takes revenge and kills the father. That's the adaptation of, uh, that's where the adaptation and the, the plot comes to play. So uh, again, uh, the, the mystery unfolds towards the end. And in Arkaryam also it happened. So this masking of crime was one of the major aspects these two movies tried to uh, try to do but then uh, it was uh, treated in a different way a totally different approach now uh, so joji shakespeare and the pandemic shakespeare never made use of the plague as a theme in any of his plays uh, he pushed it to the background and in, and in his dialogues. In the making of Joji, Dilish Potan and Sham Pushkaran followed similar approach, where they pushed the idea of pandemic towards the, uh, towards this, they actually sidelined it. They never talked about pandemic explicitly. Instead, there are a few scenes where uh, you know, the mask or the sanitizer or the isolation comes into play. So it was more or less, it was a metaphoric, uh, metaphor, metaphoric level of, you know, uh, including pandemic in the, uh, in the story or in some dialogues, it was so limited. Uh, and, uh, and Dilish Potan's Joji is not equivalent to Shakespearean uh, tragedy Macbeth, because uh, it has, uh, it has clearly given uh, its own newness and freshness to the adaptation. So uh, actually the pliability of Shakespearean works allow them to bring newness in, 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 in the narration. So Potan actually cut, cut many characters out of it and he adds new character to make it look more authentic. Or he has not, okay, the Joji is Macbeth or Bincy is Lady Macbeth. The relationship has changed when it comes to, uh, when it comes to its adaptation. So, uh, sorry. So there is this uh, line, uh, there is a statement given by uh, the professor of uh, Shakespeare studies uh, in the University of Oxford, Emma Smith. She says, the plague is everywhere and nowhere in his place. So uh, this was one of the fundamental aspect in, uh, in, uh, in adapting Shakespeare. Uh, many of the filmmakers, uh, theater performers, professors, uh, even meme creators, they've all made use of this norm very clearly. It's not that nobody has done other works, but it's it's more or less they try to adhere to what Shakespeare followed during his time. So 1603 to 1613 was the time where he wrote, you know, tremendously uh, more work of him came out. 60% of, of this time, the, the theaters during that time was closed, but still he wrote. So uh, this was a kind of, uh, you know, approach he, he uh, applied in his writing. The similar approach we can see here where there is no clear documentation inside there. It is all there in the background. It was actually even, uh, it was actually reduced into a supporting agents or agency of, uh, to, for the narration. And religion during the pandemic. The pandemic actually terrorized and frightened religion in many ways. Most of the religion had a similar viewpoint that pandemic would go on its own. Uh, in, 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 in Joji, there is this uh, scenes where, you know, the priest comes without mask and there are a lot of people uh, along with him. And there is this inhuman approach to a man who is dying they're not taking him to hospital instead they're they're trying they're praying to the god for the salvation so this scene actually uh, clearly indicates how uh, what was the kind of negligence religion has uh, towards uh, you know pandemic the way they 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 took it very lightly and uh, they kept uh, showing such scenes uh, where there were a lot of crowds for the funeral scenes of uh, this man, uh, Panachel Kutapen, who is an equivalent to the Duncan. So uh, 
so where uh, the people are uh, that's the only scene where uh, in joji they show crowds and uh, some people are wearing masks some people are not uh, the kind of and there is also the scene where binsi walks to joji knowing that joji killed his father and she asks you know you wear a mask because the happiness is evident in your face so those are the scenes where you could see and these scenes are closely associated with the religious inclination that family has got and uh, uh, where they are also taking it like that okay and uh, the elder son says okay this is a ba- bad time but we are very happy that all of you people could join us for the funeral so those things showed that you know uh, this extreme uh, inclination towards religion was taking uh, these kind of medical situation or sign the situation where science comes into play very lightly but in arkaryam it had a different uh, I- Uh, take all together there three people are there who are extremely devoted to god but it is not in the religious way but they are it is so Krishna, much spiritual you have five minutes left you have five minutes left okay okay i'll i'll wind up soon and uh, in the politics of pandemic narratives uh, where a lot of uh, you know when when two films are released during the same time uh, sh- uh, trying uh, during during the same cri- time of crisis these narratives are very different in their approach so uh, they are very dichotomous in their nature because they try to show two versions of a similar thing now arkaryam was more about the discourse that existed among the common uh, people like you know what if we go out and what if we we are you know we are affected by corona or uh, how to handle uh, parenting uh, how to handle the child children uh, how to uh, take care of the elderly people uh, and you know there is this, uh, in kerala there was a practice of all of us sitting together uh, by 6 o'clock where our chief minister used to give the updates of corona so that even that is included in the in the movie so it was all about the reality the pandemic reality that was going on in kerala it it touched everywhere the the panicking oh what is happening there is that gate closed is this uh, you know can we move through that road this containment zone and things like that but when it comes to joji joji was as i said before the sidelining was there and also they foc- they they clearly focused on not giving a remarkable or a very evident uh, you know documentation of uh, of pandemic instead they were focusing so that is that is a, the major difference when one movie focused on the community and uh, the the memory the collective memory and the collective and shared experience joji was more about you know uh, going behind an individual that is uh, more like uh, we have read a lot about this individuation that happened during covid 19 people said that uh, it is a very it is you know in a in a sense it's a very positive phenomenon that where we are the our autonomy is actually giving importance to ourselves and self care and all those things but still there was also this extreme individuation where people are not responsible for anybody apart from ourselves so joji was giving more importance to this you know uncanny transformation of this individual who was growing monstrous day by day and ending up killing his father so these two narrations uh, so joji can't be a uh, can't be taken as a documentation of the era but arkaryam can be so the the pertinent question is why these film makers opt not to discuss more uh, more uh, about the uh, existing discourse maybe there was this so much of you know furious things happening in pandemic where where there was this deliberate attempt to silence certain things uh, and only focusing on the disease disease and the 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 tyranny that is inflicted or caused by disease apart from that uh, people missed out what is happening on the government levels what is happening to the economy what is happening to our social life what is happening to the education so those things were actually uh, put in silence and we focused more on uh, 
more on just the disease so it actually helped in some way to you know manipulate certain things on on the authoritarian level as well so that politics should be discussed so i i think these two narratives are different in that way when one adhere to the discourse and try to uh, speak about that the other was a little bit of a revolutionary not to give much importance to it and but uh, but give um, giving importance to the individual during uh, during such a crisis thank you am i audible yes you are uh, i i can't see indrani uh her screen's disappeared indrani are you there i'm here i'm here sorry i lost my connection for okay. a second thank you krishna thank you sri krishna for such presentation i love the way you you know actually you know brought to light you know the multiple ways in which the pandemic you know affected the dynamics of home and you know the expressions of faith and also you know how it intersected with the evocations of crime in everyday social lived relations hello uh yeah i think i think she's lost her connection again it's okay paki you can ask the question to krishna yes uh, so i'll ask the question the social lived relations it is has something to do with the moving of the physical space the representation of the physical space with the you know what you call the psychological space do you think so it's the staging from the shift from the physical to the psychological that has led to you know the representation of how the pandemic has affected us in our day to day lives within okay i heard a, a part of your uh, your question i believe it is about how the shift from physical space to psychological space you know happened during Krishna. pandemic is that yeah yes okay uh, to answer your question yes because uh, physical space because we all get confined to a particular space during for a stipulated period of time and uh, when you look at these movies you are getting struck to a place with similar same people with whom you are having different sort of you know connection and different different levels of affection so uh, this physical uh, this the whole thing of staying under the same roof with disagreements is uh, was one of the major uh, crisis of of pandemic that that caused a lot of trauma like even you look at the crime happened uh, during covid it was because the, the the domestic violence i'm speaking about because the victim and the abuser uh, 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 was in a close contact they were in a same space uh, especially with children they have in the in the generational crisis uh, so uh, most of the time they couldn't understand what these elders are speaking they and the the elders also couldn't connect with their younger younger generation uh, and when when you ask a child not to go there it it is very difficult to actually you know i know uh, pacify him or him or her like you know okay this is this is what is going on so in terms of that in these two films if you look at it that within that physical space they're trying hard to survive they are trying hard to because they have every day they have to prepare a lot in terms of their uh, their you know uh, psyche especially when if you look at joji there are scenes where everyone is in uh, there is no overcrowding of people in a scene and most of the characters are in single room so these characters are like so frustrated they close their room and some people smokes inside their washrooms some people throw things uh, to the uh, to the wall some people just roar some people cry if you look at binsi binsi cries uh, in her room joji roars in his room uh, jason smokes in his in his room and this guy poppy who is a school goer he sits and watch some odd videos which is not helping him in any way in his education so if you look at it this this is how the space has changed your room is no more your room it's an escapade it's it's where you that's the only space given to you at that point of time so you make 
use of it in every way and it is not just it's not a physical space it's your psychological space because you can't go out and talk to your friends or uh, meet anyone and vent it out you can you can go out so in that case uh, this 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 change has happened yes thank you krishna i'm so sorry because you know we are running out of time so i would request you to address the queries that have been posted in the chat box so address them there okay. itself thank you awesome. so much for this wonderful okay. presentation and thank you for giving us a, you know throwing a light on these two malayalam films i'm sure many of us are interested in watching them and so moving on to our third presenter for this session is g tyagraj Please. Just a second, Indrani. I'm sorry for interrupting. Grace, can I please okay. uh, request you to post your comment uh, on the under the everyone uh, title and not directly thank messaging you. it? Yeah, that's it. Okay, thank you. Okay, okay, thank you, Paki. So our third presenter for this session is G. Tyagraj, PhD scholar, Department of Humanities and Social Sciences, Indian Institute of Technology, Roorkee. The paper is titled uh, "Immunity Against Fear." Uh, Cinematic prophylaxis in and through the film virus. So over to you, Thayagraj. Are you there? Uh, thank you, Indrani, for the introduction. Yeah. And uh, if my audio video is clear and if my audio is clear. Yes, we can see yes, your yes. video. You are audible, perfectly audible. Cool. So let me just uh, put my PowerPoint slides in full screen mode and uh, begin with my presentation and uh, yeah so before that before i begin with my presentation i would like to thank the organizer my session my my presentation after uh, krishna priyas as she had set the floor rightly uh, putting uh, her discussions in malayalam film cinema as well and which i'm going to continue as well with a different film though and uh, uh, as said uh, my paper is titled immunity against fear cinematic prophylaxis in and through the film virus 2019 and to give you a background about this film unlike krishna priya's uh, selected text which came during or maybe after the pandemic uh, covid-19 pandemic this particular film virus came before covid-19 pandemic almost a year or two before the pandemic uh, and uh, it is a malayalam film directed by ashik abu uh it actually deals with the nipa virus outbreak which came as a predecessor to the corona virus pandemic and uh, seeing the background of this particular film uh the text which i'm going to deal about i also give you an overview of how this presentation is uh, set up for the first half of the presentation i would be primarily talking about the concept that i have borrowed from kusn oster that is the cinematic prophylaxis and uh, uh i would be discussing and analyzing on how this cinematic prophylaxis as a as an idea as a concept is employed is engaged in this particular film virus through uh, the discussions on the images that uh, brings about uh, the discussion on uh, the disease and the deceased bodies and in the later half of the presentation i'll be discussing on the effect or the impact caused by this particular film a prophylactic impact this particular film had on the viewership of the kerala community so beginning with my presentation uh, i would like to discuss on this iconography of pandemic in very general sense like uh, uh, pandemics have been existing and continuously reoccurring in uh, different strains different forms across centuries and has been plaguing humanity ever since but uh, uh, it also becomes really important to understand how they have been represented and uh, what is the iconography all about of course it would be primarily dealing about concepts and complexities of health disease and death but it also becomes equally responsible for them to add on to the to the problems of control exclusion inequality health inequalities and marginalization and so on and of course this iconography is, uh, does not just belong to the films but as this uh, conference had extensively covered upon and discussed so far like it also goes on to uh, graphic arts uh, and uh, memes and uh, even in one of the previous panel discussions so the nfts came up as one of the iconography so which came up to be really intriguing for me to hear about 
uh, thus uh, now coming to my presentation and uh, the kind of iconography that i am talking about it is particularly located in the cinema the discourse of cinema so the pandemic films as uh, a genre in itself is a nascent genre uh, has, uh, raises questions like what is the point of the pandemic uh, films and uh, why are they made so for the first question uh, what, what the what do the pandemic film represent these pandemic films actually represent the invisible the contagion that remains invisible in dormant and the purpose of this film being made is to visualize that making the invisible visible so it goes with a very simple logic in a sense uh, that if one sees the virus one can avoid infection although it might seem very simplistic in nature but it is what it is and uh, people kind of gain a sense of let's say security or an agency when uh, they are able to visualize the virus which remains uh, unknown to human perception or to the cognition in a very like information basis at least so the making of such documentaries comes as an educational or ideological tools to regulate the responses and movement of the people but also uh, the making of otherwise filmic uh, uh, texts uh, which comes very imaginative in nature raises metaphorical discussions uh, through apocalyptic genres which not only include crises like pandemic but also zombie outbreaks and even alien invasions uh, which all comes under the cluster of sci-fi so this is what it does uh, why are they made it is primarily uh, done in so far to uh, not just represent but also to bring out a representational inoculation to make people uh, aware and understand and be prepared enough so that's the whole point of this particular genre and now uh, the question like like how viewers might think about how to act and behave either during after or in anticipation on an outbreak uh, is the question uh, which we will be addressing in this particular presentation is one of the primary research question and uh, coming to uh, the particular indian film discourse Uh, although india proved to be a very largest disease laboratory in asia as quoted by arabin samanda in his text living with epidemics in colonial bengal uh, particularly during the colonial era the emergence of epidemics uh, as malaria smallpox uh, plague and even asiatic for that name in itself uh, proves how india was constantly plagued with such kind of epidemics but uh, despite this particular fact and recurrence of epidemics uh, it is surprising to note how contagion remains relatively less addressed and underrepresented uh, theme in, uh, in in at least films uh, which is produced in indian industry or particularly in south india hollywood on the other hand has produced a grossly swollen filmic archive uh, in the name of science fiction which often has been also misrepresented and kind of uh, given otherwise uh impact of what i would be discussing like not a prophylactic impact but on the otherwise making even uh extending the history and panic right so uh this particular lack of uh, films being made on this uh, contagion and uh, discussing about them uh in in india in general has been quoted by several scholars uh which they say has been the cause of uh, lack in mediated memory that the memory which has been transmitted through forms of media uh, and the lack of the same has disabled the people uh, or the indian society to engage uh, uh, with the covid-19 pandemic in a very efficient manner as compared to the other societies where there were existing text documents and archives to look out for uh so yeah i will just show you a particular clip from this first uh, film virus this is the first opening scene of the film and uh, uh after you watch this i would explain like the point of showing this to you uh also like i would like to give you a disclaimer before i play this whole clip that there might be a lot of sensitive images which is coming forward as i borrow a lot of images and video clips uh, here on so which might come which might contain 
mutilated bodies and uh, very very triggering images for uh, dying bodies and uh, deaths and so on so please watch uh, being aware of what you are going to see right now Um, sorry to intervene, uh, Thyagraj. Are you sure you have a stable internet connection? The audio is missing and... Uh, Thyagraj, are you there? Do you have a stable internet connection? I don't think... Being recorded. Yeah, are you there? Are you there? Yeah, yeah, I am here. So, was there a glitch in between or was there a pause? No, no we, we did not hear any audio, no, so audio. I don't know whether don't that know. was from your end or not. There okay, probably was a slight, I'm sorry, there probably was a slight, uh, you know, your connection wasn't stable. It's fine. Uh, although, like, I assume that you have watched some frames of it at least. Is it right? Yeah, yeah, yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yes. so cool. Yes, that's that is the whole right. point of it. Even if you haven't uh, listened to the audio or even if you have been watching it in full sync, if you have seen some frames of it, that is fine. So what I wanted to show on the point is that uh, that is what uh, Kirsten also tries to do when she is dealing with films in her text cinematic prophylaxis. And, uh, and uh, particularly, oh, let me reshare my slide. Okay. So, yeah, so in the beginning scene, when in the you open of uh, that particular film, Virus, uh, when they show all this kind of uh, very day to day life of imagery of hospital and showing and sensitizing the viewers with, uh, with, with, with uh, how people are suffering, dying, uh, and coming up with fractures, wounds, blood, pulse, base. Uh, and all, all that kind of raw emotions and rawness of the body. And that is uh, uh, what this uh, cinematic profile has been in the book Kasna also tries to do with. It is through this very formalistic image discussions 
that also tries to say that uh, this pandemic films uh, uh, kind of kind of uh, impacts the viewers and uh, sensitizes them and uh, the film virus starts to do it in the, from the very beginning of the scene in itself and of course it doesn't show anything like an epidemic outbreak at that point but however it sets the seed there where uh, one of the first index patient comes in and later on the plot revolves and goes on and on about how the group identifies the disease and uh, kind of how it discusses how the global networks through which travels and spread and finally it chronicles uh, epidemiological work carried out by the healthcare workers and how it is contained in the end so by in a very definition offered by priscilla wald in her text contagious cultures carriers and outbreak narrative that she defines what outbreak narrative is uh this three points come as a very key element in any outbreak narrative whatsoever and the film virus does so it in a very systematic manner for instance in this particular scene i have chosen to show you like four images where they have tried to uh, understand how this microbe what this microbe is how it spreads what is a death rate what is a symptom lasting rate and how the index patients kind of traveled and who are in the primary contacts and how the virus might have spread amongst the people what is the communicability of the virus what is the start what is the source of the virus and so on so all these images which i have put in here is from the particular film itself and uh, <clears throat> now by uh, by by bringing upon this concept of cinematic prophylaxis what we are trying to prevent uh, here uh, by prophylizing something like what we are trying to prevent here is the pandemic of course it is pandemic and it comes very obvious but on the other hand it yeah, is Raj, also you have 4 minutes left you have 4 minutes left for your presentation sure sure i would try to wrap it up as much as fast Please. as i can and uh, but it also comes to be also the panic uh, in the pandemic and uh, uh, fear is something which has to be mitigated and pro- uh, prevented uh, through this modes of film and uh, although in the although during the phase of pandemic these doctors and frontline workers were highly glorified and seen as a god superheroes and demigods but the question comes like do these superheroes also fear and what was the impact of fear upon them and a fear in the front line could be seen where one of the front line worker a nurse akila seems to be dying in the particular film and the impact it has upon the doctors the carried other doctors which are shown as how i put in the image side so the fear related behaviors uh, have more than an epidemiological impact where it has an indirect mortality groups all the studies have been conducted on people uh, where they consider vulnerable groups to be including mostly high risk groups such as uh, children or elderly people or so on but a very less discussion has been made upon the impact which had been done uh, which 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 it had on the healthcare workers particularly right so but talking in an emphasis on the state of kerala uh it was able to overcome this particular covid-19 pandemic with a strong inbuilt social fabric and uh, also with an experienced leadership where in the image it is a caricature of what uh the health minister of the, the kerala then was uh, uh, the shalaja teacher and uh, she was highly revered and was also renowned by people of her leadership during the nipah virus outbreak and also during the covid-19 pandemic for instance in one of the articles it has been uh, an interview has been taken where one of the participant had noted that we learned from the nipah virus times we were prepared and our communist government showed excellent leadership for that matter so uh from this particular article uh, f- from this particular presentation i am trying to say and extend this particular argument by saying that it is not just through the direct experience of nipah virus outbreak that people were able to successfully overcome that or frame a kerala model during the covid-19 but it was also due to a production of such films like virus uh, which released in 2019 and it came as a uh a document to be looked out for when people were in high distress during the covid-19 pandemic and finally also the kerala flat and the covid-19 curve very efficiently using its uh, social policing and uh, communication and technological innovations fans of uh, 
Uh, research studies have shown that like during the pandemic, people have been uh, exposed to very limited kind of leisure activities such as watching films and so on. And fans of horror films have exhibited greater resilience during the pandemic. For instance, in Scrivener et al. and the study found that the these people who watched horror films, including the apocalyptic genres such as the pandemics and uh, disease outbreaks, the zombie outbreak, or alien invasion, and so on, and not just the mainstream horror film which has ghosts in it, uh, they kind of showed a greater resilience and preparedness, and called this kind of genre as a prepper genre or a preparatory genre, and. Uh, these kind of films comes as more than a cultural representation of sterile artifact, but it uh, it also offers some more of a prof prophylaxis, not just a sterile prophylaxis where it gets rid of a disease or something, but it also offers a psychological prophylaxis, a cultural prophylaxis where we get rid of the fear and the stigmas that comes along with the pandemic situation. So that is how this film testifies to the human ability to endure and overcome the, uh, the social crisis where the collective suffering is uh, transformed to be as a collective learning. Thank you for this, for listening and sorry for the glitch which happened in between. Uh, let me stop sharing now. Thank you so much, Thayagras. That was a wonderful presentation. And I must say, you know, you really brought to light, you know, how cultural representations like the cinematic uh, film called Virus, you know, managed to embody the movement from collective suffering to collective learning. Um, if we have a little bit of time, I would like you to address one question of mine and maybe one more question we can take up is, you know, how, you know, when you were spoken about, you know, it showcases how it impacts the medical community as such. And there was the you know one reference to you know a nurse being you know a nurse dying there in that film so did they show you know how you know her family also was impacted because you know you were talking about you know how they are also human figures and not merely you know superheroes as they have been you know labeled by the media and so on so how was they you know how was that death represented within that space of the film i would like you to just give a brief comment on it and then we can take up one more question Thank you for such a relevant question. And the film actually not just dealt with the healthcare workers, but it also had a very particular character line and character arc of how the this this uh, healthcare workers who were affected and who were struggling with this particular pandemic had a background to themselves, a family background, and how they situated from their homes and situated in the lockdown situation or in quarantine situation were really struggling to communicate with the infected and. Uh, uh, how the how they were not able to convey their emotions to each other and what was the struggle in between them and all those kind of uh, emotions were really shown in a very sensible manner in this particular film and uh, that is some something very important to be noticed as well and uh, yeah so in that way virus as a film had done a very brilliant job and covered and connected all the points thank you Thayagraj. Paki, are there is there any question so I have a question uh, myself. Yeah. So Thiagraj, first of all, uh, a very good presentation. Uh, I wanted to talk about the idea of documentation of pandemic, which you talk about uh, in your presentation. So documentation, it becomes an archive for the future generations who may want to reference the pandemic through these films, which have been produced now. So do films carry any responsibility towards the authenticity of the pandemic, so to say, or uh, such pressure uh, perspective is unwarranted for, and they should be allowed a creative license just uh, like normal films are. So is there any uh, responsibility of these films as uh, documents or documentation or archives? Um, so as I have pointed one thing, like there is a glaring distinction between the films which are made right now in uh, Hollywood industry, particularly when it uh, comes to the outbreaks, innovations uh, as one of the major themes that they're dealing with. And uh, uh, in, in one of the slides has quoted it as a grossly swollen. In the sense, it's, it's uh, really misrepresented and it is commercialized for unwanted and unwarranted reasons. And when we are dealing with uh, something very striking and uh, uh, highly impactful as a COVID-19 situation, uh, particularly in India at least, when we really lack such sources to look back from. Uh, I think uh, we really cannot afford to have a creative license here, but rather uh, very, very well-researched and well-documented works like virus should be motivated and such things should be really made more in general and uh, for the larger viewership and for our own collective learning. So 
I think I answer you that way. So thank you, Tiagraj. There are more questions in the chat box. If you could please respond to them and we'll move yeah. on to the next. Yeah, presentation. we will move on to the next, you know, thank you, Tiagraj, for your wonderful presentation. And now thank we move you. on to a final presentation for this fourth session of the final of the first day. And we have Ashwarya Kumar, PhD scholar of the School of Letters, Ambedkar University. And his paper is titled Acknowledging Loss, some reflections on the experiences of unconscionable losses in the classroom. Over to you, Ashwarya. Ashwarya, you're muted. You're muted. Ashwarya, you're muted. Uh, you can try now. I yeah. wasn't the host. Uh, yes. Thanks. Thanks, Stephen. Um, I'll just share my screen. Thanks, Indrani, for the introduction. Although, you know, I have to humbly submit that uh, only one part of your introduction is true about me. I'm a researcher. I'm no scholar. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> let us decide for that, you know. All right. So um, let me tell you a little about my paper. All the other presentations, I mean, uh, I had a lot of fun, you know, listening to uh, my fellow uh, fellows on the panel. And uh, especially, you know, because there's so much rich uh, literature to sort of read and uh, Thyagra especially, uh, thanks for the, you know, very rich literature that you provided for us to read on the pandemic. I would certainly use it if I ever, you know, write more about this subject. All right, uh, moving on. Um, I'll just read from my presentation and uh, the draft that I've prepared. And these are a few slides that I have for you on the screen. All right, here I begin. The COVID-19 pandemic has been unique in many ways. Its singularity has challenged the old ways of thinking about the category of humanitarian crisis. Customary understanding of humanitarian crisis defines it as a disaster affecting the safety of a community or a large group of people or alternatively region. On both the accounts, the pandemic defies the definitional scope of a humanitarian crisis. It was neither confined to a region or a group of people. It affected a unit of region and people that spills over the available categories of space and demography. Its effects were pan-continental and spread, spread across various groups and communities of people. Could the category of class rescue this quandary of nomenclature? In the face of lacking data, would it be imperative to assert the non-verifiable observation that the effects of the pandemic trickled inversely in the classes? The quandary of categories, as I call it, remains and presents the tricky challenge of identifying a category of the affected from a theoretical point of view, of course. Could there be in the semantic logic of the definitions of humanitarian crisis, a category of a well-defined who in the COVID-19 pandemic. If not, then how do we proceed to understand the related definitions of crisis, disaster management, relief and rescue? And the questions that emerge, who was saved? How were they saved? And most importantly, who saved who? Deliberating the above questions, we, we begin investigating the categories of the oh wait, rescuer and the rescuee. All right. That emerge in the instances of relief or rescue work in humanitarian crisis, especially institutions that rise above, purportedly rise above emergency to offer rescue and relief work. And we find that these categories of rescuer and rescuee come under great scrutiny when studied within the scope of our analysis. This challenge is marked by a significant depletion of faith in institutional sovereignty and authority. Institutions such as state, interstate organizations such as, such as United Nations and its many bodies, medical establishment and academy, media and media folded under the pressures caused by the pandemic that severely challenged their reason to be. This observation stand, stands against the grain of paranoid suspicion of institutions, of course I'm talking in the vein of uh, Eve Sedgwick, that they are neither benevolent nor harmless. These institutions simply collapse when faced with the challenge of, challenge of providing relief and rescue to those affected by the dangerous virus. 
A case in point would be the government of India. The New York Times reports in January 2020, with India reporting case numbers comparable to this falls, meaning to in 2021 when this was written, Mr. Modi declared victory over the coronavirus. The government, encouraged by a flawed mathematical model that showed the pandemic had all but ended in India, prioritized vaccines for healthcare workers and older people with conditions that made them more likely to die from COVID-19. For everybody else, the government moved slowly. The Serum Institute of India, the world's largest va vaccine maker, set aside 100 million doses of AstraZeneca Oxford University vaccine for its home country in January. That month, Mr. Modi government brought just 11 million doses. It's exported, it exported more than five times that number as afar afield as the Caribbean. In the aftermath of, aftermath of this grave misjudgment, India saw the onset of the catastrophic wave of the most threatening variant of COVID-19, commonly referred to as the Delta variant, which led to the deaths of at least 200,000 people. And this is obviously health ministry data, which has been widely contested. The failure of institutions such as the state discussed above help rethink the categories that operate in the grammar of responses of humanitarian crisis, where the institutions with the leverage of resources and global solidarity simply crashed. In turn, it, place, it places a strong, strong remural in the logic of osmosis that transpires in conducting of rescue and relief work from the apparently fuller institutions to empty affected subjects, when the considerations of fuller and empty itself collapse. What, what the states were responding to was a totality of, a, of population in absence of a particular group or location of the affected. Unprecedented in history and the condition, true to, true to the novel nature of the virus, was tragic. Another very significant facet of this, uh, just give me a second. Another very significant facet of this event that separates it from past events of crisis compar of comparable magnitudes of human deaths is the responses of the self to the pandemic. To be specific, I'm going to talk about the act of mourning. While the Indian governments allowed for the observation of religious rituals during cremations of burials, the further rituals and processes that followed the crem cremation of burial were ob observed in confinement of homes due to restrictions on movement and public gathering. The lack of participation of the community in the process of grief and mourning has impacted the individuals and societies in ways that are yet to be fully understood. It would be a worthwhile study to, the, to study the effects of this very facet of pandemic on the self psychoanalytically, but for the purpose of the paper, we are going to reserve, reserve our focus on the complex social conditions this mourning produced. In 1915, Sigmund Freud produced an important study on the subject of grief, where he tried to explain the difference between mourning and melancholia and find a more definitive explanation for both concepts. They are very tentative, as Freud has argued. Freud writes, mourning is, a, is regularly the reaction to the loss of a loved one or to the loss of some abstraction which has taken the place of one, such as one's country, liberty, an ideal, and so on. In some, play, in some people, the, the same influences produce melancholia. The distinguishing mental features of melancholia are a profoundly painful dejection, cessation of interest in the outside world, loss of capacity to love, inhibition of all activity, and a lowering of the self regarding feelings to a degree that finds utterances in self-reproaches and self-reviling, and culminates in a delusional expectation of punishment. Mourning, Freud notes, is a response to grief that recedes through a lapse, lapse of time. Melancholia, on the other hand, persists. Its features, though largely overlapping with mourning, is added by one trait of self-regression, or in other words, the self turning against the self. In the face of varied experiences of loss and responses to them, there has been a significant divergence observed in the fact, in, in the fact that the act of mourning has been compounded by the mass experience of the abject. Julia Kristeva in Powers of Horrors defines the, ab defines the abject as what disturbs identity, system, order, what does not respect borders, positions, rules. On the screen, you can see the very famous picture of Danish Siddiqui. 
there is a careful distinction that one needs to be mindful of while trying to grasp the uniqueness of the conditions produced during the pandemic. The pandemic exposed the cell to the experience of death rather than the knowledge of it. The images of mass cremation, the news of a death, death of a neighbor or a loved one, the frequent sound of an ambulance passing by, the sight of dead body bodies brought the experience of death closer, very literally. It was no more a sign of death that could be pushed aside. And, but instead, it was an encounter with the presence of signified death. The experience of grief, grief and responses to it in mourning and mel melancholia compounded with the traumatic experience of confronting the object produces the conditions of what I call unconscionable precarity. How does one acknowledge this precarity? Not death, but a certain kind of deadness produced by one, the libidinal disinvestment from the person idea and held, not displaced into another person idea to the traumatic experience of the abject. What is the condition of deadness? Something so pervasive, but impalpable to touch. Deadness that sits like, to borrow my teacher's phrase, a thorn stuck in the flesh a thorn whose nature is perhaps unknown or not fully known, but which, which is not never unfelt. Veena Das's work on partition is noteworthy for bringing forth a method of observing the unknown nature of this experience, which has a psychological substratum that lives in life as much as words. The, the concern of this paper is, however, not to clinically locate the site of the thorn to carry forward Dhar's metaphor and treat it but to think about a practice of pedagogy that allows one to learn to live with it. Now I come to the second part of my paper. The building that houses classrooms of Department of English in Jamia faces two remarkable banyan trees, or I should say faced two remarkable banyan trees to its east that stand tall in the gherau or an encirclement of the unremarkable concrete buildings of the Department of Urdu, Persian and Hindi. In the untimely and erratic monsoon this year, one of these trees got uprooted during one of the heavy storms and tore through the concrete floor. The sight of the dread, uh, dead tree evoke, invoked feelings of sublime, witnessing a Leviathan creature killed by force of God lying in front of our own eyes while we carried on the usual business of the university. It, however, created logistical issues. To remove it was a big challenge that was met with the usual alacrity of administration. The notorious but effective bulldozers were summoned by the magic of administrative problem solving through the narrow gates of the university. However, in a very Bartleby-esque moment, the trees simply refused to move, despite all the good work of the bulldozers and the men running it. It, as if, formed new unbreakable roots. Wait, let me show you the picture. A miracle, to say the least. That tree still languishes in the courtyard amidst, amidst the language building. I've taken this photo on 13th of December. While the university resumes operation, there is comparison with the banyan tree to be made for its great show of strength to withstand the storm of the pandemic. However, there is a great degree of resistance that comes with accepting such a notion, especially when the purported body of the university seems unaffected. When one cannot notice the scars of the pandemic on the university and its parts, the question that remains for the clinician to answer is, why didn't we break down? And why by extension and by extension the university? And if we did break down, then who came to pick us up? The recoiling and flinging back to action have created a sem semblance of normalcy. But one shall, one shall dare ask the question, what if, unlike the tree, one was successful in transporting the fallen tree of hurt and trauma to the unknown, unknowable landfills of insouciance. The answers lead to us to stranger roads, but one must persist. The monument of the fallen tree lives in our consciousness like that, the, like that, like the hat of Clementis, serving a reminder of one's own descent to a deadness. Humanities departments that have been already withering under the storm of great rationalization and anti-intellectualism uh, fed by the dominant ideology of the day are facing a serious existential crisis. How does one respond to this crisis that has sadly only deepened with the pandemic and not acknowledge that hurt 
the hurt that lives with us in unknown ways. How do we respond to the bureaucratization of academic practices that is both alienating and self-regressive? There has, however, never been a greater moment to return to Paulo Freire. In the introduction to Paulo Freire's standalone manifesto for eman emancipatory pedagogical praxis, the pedagogy of the oppressed, Rit Richard Shaw writes, education- Ashwari, you have five minutes left. All right, okay. Education either functions, at, functions as an instrument that is used to facilitate the integration of the younger generation into the logic of present system and bring con conformity uh, to it, or it becomes the tree uh, or it becomes the practice of freedom. The means by which men and women deal critically and creatively with reality and discover how to participate in the transformation of their world. I position the ideal of practice of freedom against the bureaucratization of academic practices as a, as a challenge for the pedagog pedagogue to take. Freire has already diagnosed and prescribed methods to tackle the banking method of teaching. What we instead to wish, wish what we instead wish to thread out is the specific practice of reading and thinking that, that have concretized through sedimentation of calculative thinking institution, institutionalized in the pedagogy of humanities education. And further, a recourse to what Martin, Martin Heidegger calls Gelassen Heist, translated as meditative thinking, that stands as the essence of the practice of freedom to study precisely the things that one chooses to study and also get compensated for. All of us who are doing PhD know that, and also receiving stipends know that. Patrick Hayes provides an incisive explication of Heidegger's concept of med meditative thinking that helps contextualize the challenge of medita meditative against calculative thinking embodied in the bureaucratization of academic practices and practice of freedom, respectively. Glashen Heist is a type of comportment towards the world which is both like and unlike the calculative. As Heidegger says, it expresses yes, and, and, and at the same time, no to calculative thinking. It says yes, insofar it re retains an active character. It is by no means a kind of passivity or a matter of outright rejection of the will of weakly allow allowing things to slide and drift along. It says yes to the desire to know and understand with calculative thinking, but it's no relates to the manner in which knowledge is brought about. And there follows in Heidegger's long meditation on the nature of waiting. Heidegger develops a special sense of waiting in which we leave open what we are waiting for, a type of waiting that he puts it, releases itself into an openness. It is important to note the integration of the meditative and the calculative in thinking. It is, as Hayes suggests, a dialogue between the two, a yes to the knowing, the process or the act, but also a rejection of the knowledge that it brings to persist. With the falling of the great edifice of humanities education that runs relentlessly despite the grievous injuries to it and those that, and those that occupy it, can one meditatively engage with the nascent stage of being fallen, destitute, probably? Can one alter the path from, product from a productivity, productivity enabled by calculative thinking as a response to the injuries suffered through the pandemic and return to reinvesting, reinvesting our pedagogical energies in the art of slow reading? or persisting with. Exemplified best by the profound protests of the violinists playing their violence against death itself in the movie Titanic as the ship sinks on an example closer to home, the tree that refuses to move. Thank you. Thank you, Ashwarya. As usual, you were absolutely brilliant, I must say, you know, bringing to, you know, so many theorists and so many, you know, ideas clubbed together. If I may just say, so the, you brought about osmosis and you linked it with political apathy and, you know, the, the relationship with the disease subject, compounded mourning with mourning and melancholia with the feelings of abject. Then, of course, you actually brought about, you know, what can we do with the, you know, these feelings of loss and mourning and melancholia within the space of academia. Having said that, you know, since you brought up that example of the tree, I have to say, you know, because it's an immediate and a personal example of the tree. You know, when I first saw it fallen down, there was that feeling of not only loss, there was a feeling of something that has been snatched away from me. Having said that, but because the tree was lying there, I also felt that, you know, it was still there. 
do you want to say something about that, that the fact that the tree has not been moved or because it has will not be moved because of whatever reasons as you all mentioned it bureaucratic reasons or whatever but the fact that it has not been moved also you know to me you know it's a personal uh, uh, understanding i feel that you know something has not changed about my relationship with jamia it's still there even though it might be fallen it's still there do you want to comment on that ashwarya this is a very personal you know subjective opinion that i'm just voicing it out aloud no of course i mean who am i to discredit your uh, association you know uh, but the way that i i used it in my paper was as a metaphor of grief you know this this uh, alternatively also which i called a thorn you know stuck in the flesh but whose effects cannot be unfelt hmm. you know some something that we can't find so the tree symbolizes for me you know that something that you know we tried very hard to get rid of you know the mourning and uh, the object of the object of loss or you know all the all the things that you know we were grieving about in the pandemic we were very quick to you know uh, uh, sort of get rid of but uh, the tree is that reminder that you know no matter how perfect you administer you know uh, these things the the process of forgetting and process of uh, uh, recovery or healing some things will still remain you know so that's that's how this metaphor came about for me yeah baki we can have one more question probably so uh, yeah uh, i i again uh, ashwarya your presentation was like a piece of poetry i really enjoyed it uh so i had again i'll take i'll uh, take what indrani said okay so there's one from fazan uh the very idea of freedom seems to underdures in pandemic one segment of society created ruckus in the name of individual freedom for example in the usa how do you see freedom getting manipulated by hyper individualism at the cost of others i i i'm not sure i got the question <laughs> but uh uh, hyper individualism at the cost of others um see i mean <laughs> it was as so for me uh, the the you know the as as what i borrow from freire and uh, others what they define as you know uh, freedom is is a kind of uh, uh, you know um, a fight against one's self you know um, where one becomes very well sort of uh, uh you know conveniently sort of you know uh, starts thinking in these calculative terms and you know and uh, i i don't want to use you know this uh, this phrase but for the lack of better sort of you know ways to explain pathological productivity you know i mean it's just so endemic in you know academics and uh, this seems like you know nothing changed you know <laughs> so yeah so that's what i what i what i mean you know as in terms of uh, freedom is is to question that and you know uh, this practice of self reflexivity i mean as a reference eschesis that is the widely discuss, discussed concept in you know in in uh, in foucault's uh, history of sexuality uh this practice of self care you know uh, that's that's what i meant fazan but we can all obviously discuss this later baki you have a question uh yeah we are running short of time so maybe you can answer it in the chat no, okay uh, so just take it up in the chat box so I'll thank just... you thank you everyone particularly all the you know four presenters you know the i think so the conversation ranged from you know the personal intimacy to the changing dynamics of the spaces of the home from you know lived social you know experiences then having moved on to the pedagogies of the classroom and how we can live not only with the pandemic but how we can cope with the sense of loss from having moved from mourning to melancholia to abject i think so this you know uh, session has been you know one of the best sessions since that i have attended in a long long time i must you know credit all my four presenters here from haryanvi folk songs to the classroom you know back again to you know the things that we grieve for and things you know that the government is showing its ineptitude and really literally showing its apathy i think so we have you know just shattered you know the whole range of emotions that the pandemic has evoked you know over the space of these two years having said
said that, you know, I like to thank my fellow organizers, you know, Sonanda, Stephen, and Ruchi, and of course, Simi Ma'am for having given me this, you know, opportunity to chair this session. And of course, Paki, who has done a wonderful job, you know, taking up the questions and of course, asking, you know, those questions. So thank you, everyone. And I would request all my audience to please, you know, continue, you know, being a part of this, you know, conference, because the next session is the keynote session where we will be, you know, discussing the ethics of distinction by Dr. Justin, if I'm not wrong. Stephen? Yeah. Yes, yeah. So, so well, thank you. Uh, could you call uh, everyone, uh, the presenters for a picture? Yes. Yes. yes, yes. And thank you, Indrani and Paki yes, for thank you, sharing and rapporteuring this session. Did a fabulous job. Had a, and fabu had a fabulous time. Thank you, everyone. Krishna, yeah. Ashwarya, Tayagraj, and uh, I hope yeah, thank you so much. It was wonderful. So thank you to all the presenters. Thank you. Thank you. I'm so sorry, Bucky. No, 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 it's okay. Continue.